Hi. So, uh, small problem. Oh, I, I figured out why the emulator kept having that problem that it did. Um, as it turns out, open emu, the emulator that I use, uh, hangs on the first frame if you have a multi-output device selected on Mac. Which, because my Mac's audio capture uh, is going through a multi-output device so it can go to my headphones and to OBS, that's why I was doing that. So, basically, I can't listen to the game audio and stream the game audio at the same time. So, I'm gonna have to trust you guys. Let me know if the game audio is too loud so that I can turn it down. Um, because I'm not, I cannot hear it. But I have it set up so that you guys can hear it, hopefully. I see the level going, so hopefully it's working. But at least the game works. So let's get into this. Should have the controller set up correctly. Yes. It's uh, playing a new game. Two months have passed since Gruntilda the Witch was defeated by Banjo and Kazooie. After falling from her tower, Gruntilda was buried underground, which is what happened at the end of the last playthrough, where she remains, waiting for her sisters to rescue her until this very day. I don't know when this came out in relation to Nuts and Bolts, but it definitely came out after Tui. So this is set after the first game, but before Tui. All right. Ah, good. It does cover the character portrait, but it does not cover up the dialogue, so you guys can read that. Meanwhile, he's still at it. We're gonna get that thing off her this entire time. His intro sequence is a bit long, but um, I've seen worse for certain. Also, um, I do have a new camera, and I do have the micro HDMI cable that I need to actually, like, use it on stream. And it'll look nicer, but I, I still gotta figure out how I'm going to actually, like, mount it up here so that it can be about where my current camera is on top of my uh, laptop. Or maybe just put it somewhere else. I don't know. I'll work it out. Um, as it stands for now, I'm still working out. Plus, I gotta figure out which port to put it in. That's gonna be a pain. Maybe I'll just get an HDMI splitter for that? I don't know. I'll figure it out. <laughs> Over time. The thing I'm glad is that because they went back to prior to Banjo-Tooie, Grunty still rhymes. Which is something I really missed in Banjo-Tooie. I know... A lot of people complained, and that's why they got rid of it in the original game, but, uh, those people suck. So why did we, why did we cater to them when we could have catered to the people who like the game? Oh, jeez, she's coming. Don't. Travel back to the past! We're going back through time. Oh boy. There we go. There we go. Here we go. days ago. Now we get another, another, uh, Bottles relative who is named after something that, uh, named after something that, uh, Kazooie called Bottles at one point. It's Bazai. He 
functions more like um, Jam Jars does in Banjo Tui. So we have to actually pay him with notes, and notes are no longer uh, just a hundred and a hundred and done in each each level world. Whatever we're gonna call it. Oh, that's right. I can set to the D-pad. Hold on. Hold on. I don't like that. Let me uh let me change that real quick. I I'm okay with the PlayStation controller, but um D-pad on PlayStation controller. Whoops. Feels uh real gross. Wait, what? What's going on? Uh okay. What is going on? Um No, why does it keep doing that? Then start, select. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know, I was hitting a single thing and it was, uh, flicking around, but... Ah, oh, it didn't do anything for the right! Hold on. Ugh. Okay, I think that should have done it. There we go. Fixed. Oh, that's right, I can't actually do anything yet. Because we forgot all of our moves! We'll actually be learning some small, uh, some, some other minor moves that, uh, account for the new shift in perspective. Oh, come on. There we go. Split up mechanic right at the beginning because it's it's a bit before you find Kazooie. I think it's like a few levels. Maybe not. It's been a while since I played this. I played it way back in high school. Um, I don't even remember like how I got it exactly. I don't know. That's that, that's one of those things that always happened when you had games when you were younger. Maybe it mostly happened to me, but sometimes you just end up with games that you don't remember at all how you got. You didn't get them from a family member or for a gift or anything, and you certainly didn't pay for it yourself because you were uh, broke as heck. They're they're very uh they're very distrustful that the player will be able to keep up with what what they are requesting. Hey. What are those? And instead of programming in new characters, they just program in a little bit of this. So yeah, the way that most of these things function, like uh opening new worlds and uh, not so much Jinjos. Jinjos are unique to this one in the way that they function. Um, and uh, the empty honeycombs look the same. You can see the lovely Miss Beehive, Honey Bee, the letter B, who's a giant bee woman. I don't know if I'm gonna 100% this. I don't recall how difficult it was, but um, I'll attempt it. You know, if I if I run into like a Canary Mary situation, which where it's just literally impossible, then I mean, it be impossible to be able to do it. But hopefully, hopefully that doesn't end up being the case. We will see. Giant bees are super rad. One, you're gonna like, um, you're definitely gonna like her. Uh, in this, in this I can't remember what she looks like, but for sure in Banjo-Tooie, they, they, they very lovingly crafted a Amazonian bee woman. Alright, 
let's go. Similar, yeah, similar to what Tui is gonna be like. The uh, the actual like level stuff is a little tedious here, getting everything set up through Jiggy Wiggy. Granted, it's a little bit more convenient than having to find where you open up the next level like you did in the first one, but that felt more exploratory, which was kind of the name of the game. Well, actually, the name of the game was Banjo-Kazooie, but you know what I mean. All right. Underwater dive. I played a little bit of this like a couple months ago um, before I started streaming and stuff. So I remember a little bit of this level. And I remember things here and there. Like I said, I have played the whole game. It was one time a long time ago. It's because I was starved for new Banjo Kazooie. Because, hot damn, they really do not want to give us new Banjo Kazooie. Like, even after they put them into Smash and showed everybody that, yeah, clearly, we want more. Gruntweed? Oh my god. How am I gonna do this? I just gotta time it? Got him. That was easy. There's, a. Uh, <laughs> There's a, uh, uh, I mean, even in original Banjo Kazooie, some of the jiggies were just like, there it is. But like here, all of them are pretty ridiculously easy. Wow, yeah, and the enemies respawn really fast. Cherries. Oh yeah, that was a new thing. Is the the two? Look at this. Look at this. It's not even an object. It makes me think of um. That game. Have you ever played Hi Ho Cherio as a kid? That game where literally you just spin and take, um, take the number of cherries that you spun, and sometimes you lose them. Like that game. That game was real dull, but I remember playing it a lot as a kid. Cause it was just a game to learn counting. I mean, yeah, that might have been part of their thing, but like. Uh, Microsoft had to be a part of it, like, if you, uh, watch Sakurai's video where he explains it, like, he does state that they work together to make it happen, and just, uh, come on, Microsoft, just be a bro! Like, the only reason they bought Rare, and uh, Rare has kind of sucked under Microsoft, but, um, the only reason they bought Rare is because they thought that they would get the Donkey Kong license. Which is ridiculous, because why would a third-party developer have the license to that just because they made a game of it? Alright, collecting. Here we go. Yeah, that's the thing, is like... While, yeah, this is obviously, like, not the strongest... Whoops. Not the strongest graphics being on GBA, it's a full Banjo-Kazooie game. Like, it has the same stuff that you'd get in Banjo-Kazooie or Banjo-Tooie. And it's, it's just, it's good. I don't know why nobody talks about it. Maybe because they didn't really, um, they did not really, like, market it at all. Like, that's what I'm saying. I don't remember, like, asking for it or wanting it before I had it. I genuinely do not remember when it, how, how I had it. Maybe it was one of my brothers's, and I just played it? I don't remember. It's, b it's been a long time. My brain is full of holes. Exactly, yeah, there's no way they were giving up Donkey Kong. Which, um... Whoop. Yeah. Which, Donkey Kong... 64... I feel like is why they were willing to give up Rare, because that game really blows. I will stream it at some point, because I do still 
like have a ton of nostalgia for it, but it's it is not a good game. It's so bad. I don't know what the thought was there, but man, it was it was a heaping hunk of garbage. What do here? How does this work again? Hmm. I think that's like a challenge thing. Oh yeah, and there's still like the mumbo transformations in this one. So, uh, sorry, I keep looking at the chat. Still need to get, like, some kind of arm to, uh, hold my phone up for the chat. Oh, okay, I guess not. Hold on, I know there's a way to get up onto that. There wouldn't be a ladder there if there wasn't. Oh, you know what? I don't even have the ability to climb yet. So, I gotta get that first. And this might be the guy. Try this useful roll attack. And just like the original, now that I know the roll attack, pretty much never gonna use the pack whack on purpose. Yeah. Because this is just so much better than having to stand still and that. I mean, it covers a little more ground than the original move that Banjo would do, but. Oof. Is that why people did it? Because I know it came, it was like, it came with the, uh, the thing. Because they realized, the production of that was actually that, uh, um, while they are making Donkey Kong 64, they just hit a game-breaking glitch. There was no way to fix it, except it completely circumvented it when you had the, the RAM expansion pack. And so they had to, at cost, Give that out. So yeah, it costs Nintendo a lot of money. Hence why... Hence why they, uh... They ended up getting rid of those fellas. Yeah, I hear Klungo. These are just like the ones in Banjo-Tooie. Which I'm just assuming people have played, although it is less popular than, uh, Kazooie. Which, I guess, fair enough. I like it more that it is a uh, it is a bit less elegant of a design. There's a lot it's a lot less intuitive for sure. There's a lot of backtracking and oddities. But it also makes it feel more organic to me. Like it makes it feel like more of a real lived in world. But that's just that's my opinion. That was the only way to get it in North America? I thought you could get it separately. I didn't know, because I only ever got it through Donkey Kong 64, so I didn't have a reason to look for it in other, other ways. But, huh. Did Majora's Mask not work without it? Because, like, I never, um... I didn't have Majora's Mask. My brother did. I didn't really like Majora's Mask that much. I got the 3D one, but everything I've heard is that the 3D one is, like, way, way worse than the original. I just... The whole, like, going around town and, like, finding everybody. I'm not a huge fan of that because, like, my OCD m makes it so that I... I, I uh, if I can't get 100% of everything, it, it, it just makes me feel unhappy. saw that she can I know banjo stop stop she can hello oh this was the other thing it's mini games the B button to power up your cast Oh, okay, it's a fishing game. So I gotta catch... There we go. Okay. Yeah, it's just fishing. Got him. Uh, I think I got a bad start on this, but I will... Get that sheep. Get that sheep now. I 
wish you could get multiple. Because they didn't have the, uh, the programming ability. There we go. Easy. Yeah, yeah, Banjo, or, uh, Donkey Kong 64 did the same thing. Hmm, it's interesting. You would, th I, I, I guess I never noticed because we had Donkey Kong 64 well before we got Majora's Mask. So we just had that in, there was no reason to take it out. Um, maybe that's why Banjo-Tooie also wasn't quite as, uh stuttery as um as I've seen footage of it cuz uh from my understanding it like stuttered like crazy because it was just a little too advanced for the N64 and probably should have waited till GameCube but you know the more um but the uh oh those bubbles don't count but uh the yeah it ran okay for for us, so I guess that's just because we had the the RAM expansion. Huh. Weird. Is there a secret? Is there a sneaky secret? No. No secrets for me. What's up? It's also the perspective's a little weird. Cause you can actually go quite a bit into this. With how it's set up. She can. She can. Yeah, I could play Majora's Mask at some point. I was not a huge fan of it, um, personally, but if there's enough buzz, like, I like Ocarina of Time okay. Um, I've actually been considering. Pretty much everybody's seen the sequelitis at this point, where Aaron Hansen points out some very glaring flaws in the design of Ocarina of Time. And the thing is, he's not wrong. The uh, the flaws that he points out are actually flaws. And uh, a lot of people kind of dismissed him out of hand, but also, he kind of dismissed a lot of other people out of hand because, um... He acted like the fact that these flaws exist means that you can't resonate with the work. And I, I want to do kind of a response breakdown of why, why it is that even with all of those flaws, people are able to ignore them and the game, uh, they're able to resonate with the game in a way that seems like it shouldn't be possible from an academic level because of how flawed the game is. Ah! Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty solid. He makes some good points. Obviously, there's there's definitely some nitpicking in there that kind of weakens it. But, um... At the same time... Like, I don't know, it it has some good points. Oh, you can choose what to be. That's that's actually more of a Donkey Kong 64 thing. Interesting. Um So yeah, I just want to break down like why which of his points are hold up, which of them are just kind of nitpicks. Just do a breakdown of that. And then also it feels like a disservice to to ignore the fact that people like it. Like, I, I actually tweeted about this recently. There was a, um, there was an article in Business Insider that was just, a, it was pretty much just a review of Animal Crossing New Horizons that said, um, the title was like, it's time to admit that Animal Crossing New Horizons is a d dumb, boring game for babies or something like that. And then it was just a review, and it was them explaining why they didn't like it. And my tweet was basically like, you are a professional business writer. You see that this product is resonating with a large audience and is very successful. 
And yet, instead of taking the time to analyze why that is and see how that can apply to business, you instead decide to d dismiss it out of hand and just say, well, I don't like it. What does that help? Like, that, do that does not help anything. That gives me nothing. You cannot, in art or in business, just ignore um, an audience. No matter how much you agree or disagree with them, what what they think of a product or what they think of a work or a piece or anything um, says something about that work. And it's important to analyze that if you want to actually get an idea of why some things work and why some things don't. And I feel like that's that's something that the sequelitis uh, did not do. And there have been responses to it as well that frustrate me. I saw one response video that was just a moment-by-moment -moment recap and response. And the guy's only real points were, um, well, I didn't mind. I, d I didn't mind having to wait. I had the patience for it. And it's like, that's not... That's not, like, a, a rebuttal, though. Like, just... In the same way, it's like, just because you had the tolerance for that, that doesn't justify it as a good design choice. Or... Uh, like, rebut his point about it. So, in both cases, like, I, I feel like there is something in there that needs to be uh, paid more attention to. Yeah, Animal Crossing is is definitely relaxing. Like, that's the thing is like it's it's relaxing, and it's a lot of people are very much into the. Uh, <laughs> the uh, town building aspect, like, in the same way that people play, like, City Skylines. I personally find that game kind of dull, because I'm, I, it's just not something I have patience for, or something I have a large vision for, so I personally don't enjoy it, but I love seeing other people who do enjoy it, and seeing, like, what they like about it, and seeing what they make with it, and how it inspires them. And that says a lot about how it works. It's like, it's just a different taste in that way. And I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's something to be said there. I, I'll probably make a video of that at some point in the future. Yeah, that's a big thing I see um, in board game. Uh, in the board game community is that a lot of people praise production value and the, the the price of something changes drastically depending on what the production value is like but then it's like you look at a lot of games that have been made through Kickstarter a lot of times in Kickstarter they have to have stretch goals right it, so that you know if things are going well they have something to build to so people can feel like they're getting more value and their idea of adding value is just adding more miniatures, adding more pieces and stuff. But, but that feels like... I don't know, that, that feels like kind of a problem. Because, like, not only does it mean that the cost of the thing is going to be so much higher when it goes to retail, if it plans to go to retail, which it should, but that's, that's another point entirely. Um, but also, like... Sometimes it'll be more in the form of like expansions and it's like this is the game has not been out yet You don't know what needs to be expanded on and fixed because like that's basically like a heart a software patch for the physical games That you're putting out before you even know if it's necessary. It seems it seems very odd to me and I understand the reasoning behind it but it also means that a lot of Kickstarter board games are kind of garbage that is mostly based around, um, most of the game is just based around what they're able to fit into it. And what kind of pieces they're able to have. And I understand, I get, I, I understand. I can relate. When I see a game that is just full of, like, cool pieces, that's enough for me sometimes, you know? Sometimes, um, the way they put it on Shut Up and Sit Down is like, is having a really nice object enough? Sometimes it is. Like, that's why I, that's part of why, no matter what, like, I can hear 
criticisms of Root and other games from here to eternity, but like, I'll always love Root partially because of just the production and how great it looks and how awesome the pieces are. Some of them do. Um, a lot of them will also have different packs of figurines so that you can like upgrade, basically. It depends entirely on the actual, um, on the Kickstarter itself, because they, they all do things a little differently. There was a Kickstarter recently for uh, a new game by Edmund McMillan, who created Binding of Isaac and Super Meat Boy and a lot of other great games. Uh, he made a card game called Tapeworm, which I kickstarted um, as well, like I pledged to that. And he was actually having a lot of trouble of what to do for uh, his stretch goals, because he was like, what do I add? The, it's a full game already. What more can I add to this to like add value to it? And uh, yeah, it, it was interesting what he decided on. It was a not safe for work version that he made. That's <laughs> pretty fun. Um, he included like a bunch of stuff for Binding of Isaac, which he said is kind of like. Um, and one, you'll you, you might be able to appreciate this because you're into toys. He compared it to when you get an action figure that has like a piece of a larger action figure. So that if you get the whole set, you can, like, build the whole thing. Which has made a resurgence, but apparently was a thing when he was a kid. The Trogdor board game, yeah, that was one thing they did. Apparently that game is not very good, but I kind of want to get it just because... It's Trogdor, man, come on. I don't... I don't need to justify Trogdor. I know it's, it's a bit dated at this point, but, like... It's classic, dude. Like, pretty much everything Homestar Runner is pretty iconic to the internet and internet culture. So, as a person of the internet, who spends most of my time on there doing things, as I'm doing right now, um, it feels like something that uh, would definitely be within my wheelhouse. Everything I heard from people who actually like uh, board games is that it's kind of garbage, though. Yeah, that's what it is, the build of figures. So he's basically saying he he's by doing some binding of Isaac stuff in his uh, tapeworm the card game Kickstarter, he's trying to basically do like build a figure. And like a lot of the stretch goals were adding new cards for binding of Isaac or adding new cards for uh, tapeworm. And if he does another binding of Isaac, he said he'd probably do more tapeworm stuff in that. So that should be cool. It's it's gonna be a fun game, it looks like. Um, his goal with it, he said, is for it to be like Uno, a game that you can quickly learn, is really fast to play, and is really good for socializing. Because he had a whole story in a stream about how he, um, and I'm paraphrasing, he, he had a long story about it, but basically he would go to like day camp when he was a kid because his mom uh, worked, so she needed some, uh, form of childcare, and that was what she ended up going with. And, uh, she would take them there, and the first time he was like, oh, I'm, j I'm just, like, a fag kid, and I'm ha I, I'm shy, but then the, the people who ran it were like, um, we're all gonna play Uno. And so by playing that, he, like, made friends, and he was able to socialize, and it made it, like, an easy icebreaker and stuff. So his, his goal with Tapeworm is for it to be a game like Uno in that way, where it can it can bridge gaps between social groups and it can get uh, get people talking. And I hope as much. I spent a lot of money. I I, I went for the like uh, it was the $169 tier, which after shipping is like closer to the $200. But it also comes with like a set of Binding of Isaac figures and the Binding of Isaac Kickstarter gold box that um, this is the last of them. They're not gonna be able to ever get more of those gold boxes. So that's specifically why I got that tier. Um, Cause like, it, it has, they've said it's like literally the uh, the expansion that came in the gold box only exists in the gold box. They're never reprinting it. So it's, uh, it's good to get that. 
Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited to get it. I have a few Kickstarters that I've pledged to that I'm uh, still waiting on. I did uh, a late pledge for Fossilis, which is a family game where you're uh, hunting fossils, and it's like a big like resin uh, board, kind of like boggle, and you like shake all these bones into it, and then like stack tiles, and then you like pull the tiles off one by one like you're digging through dirt. It's super cute. Um, that's supposed to come out in August. All, I mean, all the Kickstarters have kind of been pushed back a little bit because of the whole coronavirus situation making uh, shipping and manufacturing a little difficult, but they've said they're going to still be on schedule for that. Um, so that one is pretty good. Uh, Oath, which is the new board game from Leader Games, specifically designed by Cole Worley, who designed Root, which is my favorite board game. Um, and it's a legacy game, but the idea is that it doesn't permanently change the game exactly. It permanently changes the, like, items that you're specifically using in each game, and it, like, it's supposed to, like, slowly, like, change the world of the game over time, which is pretty cool. I, I really like that concept. I've always liked the concept of legacy games, but it's, like, the legacy games I've seen are just shit that I don't care about. Like, um... Risk Legacy, which I'm okay with Risk, but it's it's kind of uh, it's it's the most basic Colonel Blotto style war game, um, and uh, Pandemic Legacy, which I'm not really a fan of Pandemic, but I'm considering giving it a try because it's uh, Shut Up and Sit Down has like really lauded it as amazing, but I just Pandemic is effectively solitaire that you just play with. Every, a group of people. That's not necessarily a problem, but it's also kind of underwhelming. Um, but yeah, Oath should be cool. We got... Uh, Coco actually did this one, but uh, the Root Tabletop RPG, which is officially licensed, being uh, published by a different publisher and such, and designed. So that should come out sometime later this year. I also ordered the game uh, Thornwatch, which was designed by Mike Krahulik. Um, I mean, the, the, the art and stuff is by Mike Krahulik of Penny Arcade, and uh, Jerry Hulkins of Penny Arcade also did stuff with it, and all this different stuff. So I'm excited for that. Uh, the thing is, Lone Shark Games, who make Thornwatch, and also are mostly known for Lords of Vegas, which is uh, described as, what if Monopoly was good? which I like. Um, they did a Kickstarter, and because of everybody being stuck inside, they've actually made a new... They've made a sale where everything's like 50 or 60% off. And so with Thornwatch, it's usually $75, and right now it's 25 which after shipping, it's a little under 40 But that's still pretty good. That's still half off of like a pretty big game. It's like a fusion of tabletop RPG and uh, board game, I guess. I've seen reviews, people aren't like super jazzed on it, but I wanted to get it anyways just because I love Penny Arcade and I want to support um, them making more stuff. And if they ma start making board games like the way Edmund McMillan is, I'm stoked on that. Alright, opening up the second spot and it's a beach! Once again, second area is a beach. Which probably means water, but I only am really, like, scared of water when it's, like, in 3D and 64 games. Because the low draw distance makes it real spooky. Alright, with that, I'm gonna take a quick uh, biology break. Uh, let me check the chat real quick. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will go off about Monopoly when I get back here, but I'm gonna use the, uh... I'm gonna take a biology break real quick, so BRB. Sorry, my uh, my shortcuts for OBS are a little different for this one. BRB.
All right, I am back. Um, I almost put my headphones back on and I remember that they're not gonna do anything for me in this particular stream. But yes, Monopoly. So, Monopoly is a bad game, full stop. And I don't feel like I'm being that radical by saying that. Pretty much everybody agrees Monopoly sucks. Um, and the main reasons are because it's too long, which I will I will agree. However, a lot of people make it longer because they play with the two house rules that uh, are a terrible idea. The two house rules that almost everyone plays with are free parking gives you um, oh wow was that just a jiggy in there? Uh, free parking gives you money, which means that the economy is a lot larger, which means that in a game where the main game end, the game end, the game ends only when everybody else goes bankrupt. So you're adding stuff to the economy in a game that you think takes too long. In a game where the economy goes, like the economy dictates how long the game will be. Okay, it's a little foolish, guys. The other thing that people do is they don't do auctions. Um, oh yeah, here's the big B. Honey bee! She's gorgeous. She looks pretty good. Everything just looks kind of like it's a more pixely version of the 3D models. Alright. Okay. But yeah, uh, so if you don't know, in Monopoly, uh, you, if you decide that you do not want to buy a property when you land on it, it is supposed to go up for auction immediately, where everybody takes, takes a moment and decides how much they want to buy it for, and you just go one by one, starting with the person who landed on it, I think, yeah, yeah, to hopefully get it for cheaper than it's worth, and, uh, I think I have to get a thing later to get through there. Um, and that means that everybody will uh, be... I guess I should jump. Maybe the perspective was just weird on that. But, um... Oh yeah, it looks kind of like the Honey Nut Cheerios be. Um, but the thing... Auctions. Yes, auctions make it so that you will be able to sell off all the properties really quick. And uh, as someone pointed out, the better house rule, if you want to go fast, is to go is to uh, take all of the properties, shuffle them, and deal them out randomly to everybody at the very beginning. That makes it way faster. And then uh, you just play to a certain money amount rather than trying to uh, play it until people go bankrupt. In fact, even Monopoly has noticed that that was a diff uh, bad idea because in their official rules, um, it, the, the goal is not for everyone to go bankrupt, but for uh, two people to go bankrupt and then the game ends. Uh, it's also awful because it has the worst board game component to exist, which is the... Uh, Yeah, the worst board game component to exist, which is paper money. It feels gross, and nobody likes it. So, if you play Monopoly, get yourself some nice weighted poker chips. It will improve uh, quite a bit. It will improve the experience a great deal. But, uh, yeah, another... Awful, awful house rule I've heard is that uh, you aren't allowed to buy property until every until you've been around the board once. So that literally just makes it one round longer for no reason. And you can't you can't make any interesting decisions in that time. Like what are you supposed to do when you're just sitting there not getting anything? I just. Terrible. It's just, it's a slow game. It's almost entirely about luck. It's, uh, yeah. It was originally designed, and I know a lot of people say, oh, it was designed to show the horrors of capitalism. It wasn't. It was the, it was to show the benefits of Georgie, Georgianism, I believe it was called. Georgism? 
uh, which is the idea that, um, it's like the idea of a free market only for landlords, I guess? And the idea was that you would play it, you would play it following the rules of capitalism and a free market, and then you would follow it in, under the rules of, uh, uh, under the rules of a free market or s something. Yeah, no, the paper money just it just feels gross. You know? Like, I just... Ooh, it feels bad on your fingers. It's terrible. Paper money... It's just the worst. So yeah, weighted poker chips are a big improvement on Monopoly. The bigger improvement... And I've actually been meaning to make a video about this. I have a lot of videos um, on the back burner about just, like, video games and more of a kind of reviews, but also analyses, um, I, I really want to explain, that basically the idea is, can Monopoly be fixed? Like, can we make a version of Monopoly that is good? Um, and, uh, it would go through different versions of Monopoly with different rules, like, uh, cheaters, the, the cheater edition of Monopoly, which is, okay, I mean, it, it, shakes it up a bit, but it's still Monopoly in the end. But then also, um, the, uh, Monopoly Gamer, at least the, the version that I have, uh, the Mario version, is actually a much better version of Monopoly because it ends at a more organic time. Like, it's, it's, it's not the best, but it, like, it has a, a built-in end function so that the game cannot ever go more than eight rounds long. Which means that it's a very fast game in comparison. But because they changed that, it makes all of the property stuff feel so secondary that it makes you kind of wonder why they left it in at all. Um, I digress, though. That's, that's, that's my particular thing about it. It's also, yeah, Lords of Vegas is supposed to be what is supposed to be a good Monopoly, and it's kind of like, it, it's, it plays like Monopoly, you know, you have uh, property and stuff, but instead of like going around and rolling and moving, um, you have a, you have a, a board uh, covered in like slots, so it's like the, the Las Vegas Strip, and you... You have a bunch of buildings that have a little slot in the middle where you can put a D6. And you can change the value of that building by turning the D6 to another side. And you can do that by investing in it to upgrade it. And you can, like, uh, do it for other people as, like, parts of, like, deals and stuff. It, like, it, it just brings the idea of being, like, a big property owner um, into a more fleshed out feel. Because with... Monopoly, it feels like they just had the idea and they didn't have a good idea of how to uh, actually accomplish it. Whereas in um, in Lords of Vegas, they actually took the time to do it. In Lords of Vegas, because of the Kickstarter they did re recently, is getting a reprint um, with expansions even. So definitely go check that out. Uh, I think the Kickstarter is over, but it has late pledges enabled so you can still buy it. I just spent $200 on the, the other Kickstarter I was talking about, so I probably will not do that anytime soon, but hopefully I get a chance to. At the very least, they're reprinting the game, which is, is good. People can play it. I definitely recommend it. If you didn't like Monopoly, but you kind of... As, as I have, it's like, I've played Monopoly and enjoyed it, but it always felt lacking, so it's kind of for that person. Ah, uh, dang. You want egg? I have no egg. That's exactly my point. That's what's up with Monopoly Gamer is that it's like, it's so, it's different, which makes it good. Like, it, they're all positive changes, but they're so severe that it completely changes the feel and the, like, goal to the point where it makes it feel like it's not Monopoly anymore. But it's good. If you can get... I mean, it's better. I, I would say Monopoly Gamer is still a little dull, because it's still Monopoly, but it's faster. So, 
if, if you want the Monopoly experience much faster with Mario characters. Um, the Mario figurines are pretty cute. And if you get the, the collector's edition, which I have, it comes with a bunch of plastic Mario coins that are just so nice. They're so cute. I love them. And I'm actually going to do um, one of the episodes of Whiteboard Games Season 2 is on uh, is on Monopoly Gamer. Uh, specifically my edition, which I have all of the different different characters and everything, which you had to buy in, like, t technically booster packs, but they weren't blind bags, so it doesn't feel unfair. Like, you knew that you were getting the one that you needed, and I just got all of them, because why not? At the time, I was doing much, much better financially, so I was like, whatever, I'll, I'll buy some good games. I didn't buy many good games. I actually bought a lot of really bad games that just looked cool, and then, yeah, like, um, the Scott Pilgrim. Scott Pilgrim's precious little card game that I've never played because it is impossible to play the way it is written. The rules, it's literally broken. Like, the, the rules do not teach you how to play it, so you cannot play it as the rules are written. And I've tried, I've tried multiple times, and even when I tried to, it's just so convoluted and boring and confusing. It, it, they didn't even use original, like, artwork for it, it's just stuff straight from the comics, so you don't even get anything in that. Um, it's a huge box for a game that's, like, really just, like, one, like, 80 deck, like, 80? Yeah, like, 80 card deck. So it's like a, a big board game box, like not the full like Monopoly style one, but like a smaller like square Betrayal at House on the Hill box for like an 80 card deck and then like five larger cards laid on their back. And the biggest insult is that for that, $45. That's wild. I... To put it in perspective, most like board, like card games, deck building games, are at are like between like ten to thirty dollars. Thirty dollars if they're really good. And if you're like, if you're selling your card game for forty five dollars, it better be amazing. And I just it wasn't. It's not good. And I'm doing whiteboard games on that too. But that's gonna be a. Uh, see if you if you watch the show which i would appreciate it if you did iggy kids whiteboard game season one is up on youtube already if you look it up, up iggy kids whiteboard games um you'll find a playlist of season one and yeah i will be making season two shortly i i already have the beginnings of the writing done i got a new camera new table all sorts of stuff upgraded. Okay, I got it. That's 40 cards for about $20. Mm. Yeah, nah. I don't know about that. Um, I'm, I'm just saying, like, as far as board game style card games, like if you buy a, a fully contained card game, it, it's usually on the cheaper side. Like, so it, it's pretty insulting that a game that contains no new art for their property, the property that is like the selling point for the game and clearly why it has the high price tag, like you didn't give any new art, which is garbage. And you just, like, threw together this crap game. It's so bad. Like, even if it was playable, which it is not, it's just, it just wouldn't be very good. Uh, oh, no. We got to help. Hello? What was your name? Okay. Well, I have two already. So that's a good start, I figure. Whoops. I fell. Oh. oh. No. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, 
Yeah, trading card games are a little pricier, so I can understand that being the price, but uh, I don't know, for what, what you get. And to add insult to injury, uh, there's a there's a huge catalog taking up most of the space in that box, which is so wrong. I I I'm so mad about that because it's like, really, you already have a terrible game, and you're just gonna say like, hey, you like that you wasted money on that? How about you uh? But you waste some money on some other stuff that we made. So insulting. Come on, guys. Now, I like Scott Pilgrim quite a bit. Like, Brian Lee O'Malley has made better work. I would say, um... What is it? Sequels? Seconds? It was the graphic novel he made after Scott Pilgrim. That is, uh, much better than Scott Pilgrim. And I like Scott Pilgrim as a comic quite a bit. I, I enjoy the movie... Um, it has some problems, but I'm not the first to say that, for sure. <sighs> Turned on. Yeah, that's the thing is, uh, board games is an expensive hobby. Because, like, most of the bigger games cost, oh, upwards of $80, $100 even. Like... Some of the big, like, Twilight Imperium, which is, like, the prototypical, like, big game. A game of, uh, TI takes about eight hours with four players. Um, and that game is, like, 150 bucks, I think. But then, like, the average game, somewhere in, like, the 40 to 60 range. You know. And then, like, a lot of the classics are, like, 30, so... Not too bad. Why am I collecting all this health? I don't even need it yet. Over here. Gotcha. This was one disappointing thing about this game is the um the lack of boss variety. It's pretty much just like this of their force field, watch out, and then you get to take them out. And there was also uh, these like first person boss battles that uh, we'll run into later. Um, you just gotta, you just gotta wait for those. Those are okay. They, they kind of work like um, a previous uh, Galaga, like the the, the vertical shmup kind of thing. Um, they're okay. They're definitely unique to Banjo Kazooie, but it's like that's. It's pretty much the only two types of boss fights you get. A little disappointing. Oh! Got him. Yeah. Oh, well, because that, that is just a moment directly from the comic, and the implication is that he's supposed to look like the the comic version. I'm still... Uh, I'm still not 100% sure. Well, yeah, I don't really think I can think of anybody else who would have been a better Scott Pilgrim. But... I... Mm, I don't know. I, I, I like the movie, but it, it, it didn't understand... Um... Oh, okay. The, uh... It, it didn't really understand the comics. And it's not my place to really say that Edgar Wright, of all people, didn't know how to, uh... How to write comedy. But I just feel like he kind of fundamentally misunderstood what the comic was about because it was about um it was about like Scott being a bad person like that's why so many people criticize Scott Pilgrim because they should he's a bad person and he, he himself does not recognize this until it's way too late and he's ostracized most of the people out of his life and is alone um 
and when he finally does make that realization, like, it hits him like a ton of bricks, and he, he tries to put things right, but at that point, it is too late. And at that point, is, um, it, it, in the comics, Gideon ends up getting killed by uh, Ramona, the person who actually had, like, a stake in the fight, and it was about her finally, like, fighting for her own autonomy. And now that she and Scott, while still not great people, they've, they've started the journey towards being good people. And so they, they figured they, it may as, they may as well give it another shot with each other. So it's, yeah, it's much better as a comic. Um, I would say read the comic and then watch the movie and recognize that the movies, the movie was made before they, um, before the comic was finished. Like they wrote the movie while the last, uh, last, uh, comic, um, volume was still being made. Ah, yeah, see, this is what I'm saying. It's, uh, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the other boss fight type, is this first person mode, where you just kind of have to hit weak spots and dodge. It's okay. Um, it's nothing special. It just sucks that this is like the only other type of boss fight. Whoa! Oh jeez. Oh, there was nowhere to dodge there. Whoa, watch out. A little bit of its RNG. Oh wow, that was it. That was pretty quick. I remember that being a lot harder when I played it last, but I was also an idiot when I played it last, and uh... I mean, that implies I'm not an idiot now. I certainly am. But uh... I at least kind of can play game. From time to time. Hello? Flap. Finally. Finally learning our moves from the past. And I like that they actually have a decent reason for why you forgot it. I know some games like um, uh, the Metroid series will remove your abilities but uh, not give you a good reason. In fact, Captain America was like a later addition to the Avengers, wasn't he? Alright, get the treasure, got it. Go! Go! I'm pretty sure I should just like not grab it so that I'm not a uh, target. Wait till the well, may as well. Watch out! Whoa! Watch out! Watch out! Okay, okay. Just gotta hold on to it for 25 seconds. I can do that. Nope, nope. Nope, don't, no! Oh, he's got me broadside! Woo Get out of here! No! Oh! Ah. Get him, get him! No, no! Oh! It's mine! It's mine! Woo! Yes, got it at the very end. Nice. Yeah, well that's the thing is that Hulk pretty much only exists in the Avengers as far as the MCU goes. Because they refuse to give him his own movie. And there, there is a decent reason for that. I, what was it? Um, uh, right, uh, somebody said... I believe they were a writer on Hulk. Somebody said it's very difficult to do a Hulk movie because... Um, the Hulk 
the Hulk's whole conflict is that he cannot give in to the Beast and become the Hulk. But to have a satisfying movie, the audience needs him to become the Hulk. Like, it's the only entertaining moments for most audiences is when he is the Hulk. So it's just a, a weird dichotomy that uh, just doesn't work for movies very much. I don't know. I like that Norton Hulk movie, though. I'm gonna go on record saying that right now. That movie was okay. And it was, like, the first movie in the MCU, I'm pretty sure, right? Or Iron Man might have been slightly before that. I don't remember exactly, but I remember liking it a lot and being pretty disappointed that Ed Norton could not be the Hulk again, but also, um... He's a total ass to work with, apparently, and refuses to work on a movie um, that he hasn't basically, like, completely rewritten. So, I don't blame them for getting rid of him. Oh, they have the rights? Huh. Guess that makes sense. Well, why couldn't we have Dark Universe with Hulk? Huh? I don't know. I also will go on record saying that while I didn't see The Mummy, and I know it was bad, I was still really disappointed that the Dark Universe isn't going to happen. Because, let me tell you, the concept of the Dark Universe really cool to me, okay? I like the idea of the Dark Universe a lot. And I know a lot of people are like, who the heck likes the Dark Universe? I do. I wanted to see it. Uh, cry. Would have loved to see a bunch of edgy, crappy, whoops. Um. Uh. MCU style, like, Universal Monster movies, but nope. Mummy had to suck. So, whatever. A lot of people disagree with me on this, but I was looking forward to it. Hmm. Oh! I died! Whoops. I was reading the chat, sorry. Uh, I guess... I don't know, man. The whole universe thing, I think, is just gonna die off, because Endgame... Like, they've already cancelled Black Widow because of coronavirus, and honestly, the film industry is gonna tank pretty hard, which is kind of nonsense, considering that they could easily continue making movies. Like, they have enough money. Don't act like they can't make more movies using their reserves, but... That's gonna be their excuse, that's gonna be their excuse. Can't really... Can't really deny it. I, there's no... There's nothing I can say that's gonna stop them. Oh, okay. I guess delayed, sure. I heard cancelled, but I guess, I guess I heard wrong. Um... And yeah, that's that's pretty much the thing, is the only reason the MCU worked is because Iron Man was such a good movie. Like, that, mo if that movie had not been that strong, it would have just fallen apart immediately. And that's the reason, despite them continually trying to make the uh, DC Cinematic Universe a thing, it's just continually falling on its face, because they have yet to have a single solid DC movie in this universe. Just none of them are really that good. Some of them are alright, like Shazam was really good. I like Shazam a lot, but most of them are pretty, pretty bad. So, you know, I just, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bad situation for liking movies. Because we're not going to get a lot of good ones coming up. There's also the whole, like, what is it? Yeah, Shazam. I said Shazam. Shazam was good. 
but Shazam was m very late in the game. You can't have, like, a half dozen movies that are interlinked and wait until, like, the sixth one to have a good one. You know? Alright, I think I'm gonna do this bit, and then I'm gonna call it night. I've made pretty decent progress, I think. And I will continue these on Sundays now that I have a... Whoa, that's a cool animation. Now that I actually have, like, a solid, uh, way to do it. Like these, these, like, punk rock regals. Ah, yes. Iggy Twiggy. Okay, so this is pretty much the same as the eggs from the uh, last world. Probably. I mean, I I like some of the MCU uh, uh the MCU movies that um or the MCU shows that were on uh Netflix. I mean, I liked Punisher, although Punisher is just pure like fascist wet dream. Like, this whole extra-judicial ju thing is just, ugh, it's not great. Um, I just find it entertaining more than anything. I really don't agree with most of what it's trying to push. Uh, but, um, b -b 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 Daredevil. Daredevil was good for the first season. Second one was kind of weak. Oh, crap. Um, although that season three of that was canceled, I guess, so that's unfortunate. Sucks. Try it again. It was only two off, so I should be able to get that. If I'm a little more uh, clever about it. I do like. Um, oh, crap. Those are the two I missed. I do like that if you if you pay attention to the other bit uh, to the left, you can actually see what's coming up. So it does give you like a bit of a heads up. Ghost Rider is pretty rad. I wish there was the MCU would include Ghost Rider, but uh, the most they did was Marvel Knights, if you remember that, which was Ghost Rider 2 and Punisher Warzone, neither of which did very well, so they kind of just cut, cut that one off pretty early, which is unfortunate, but yeah, it's good stuff. I watched the first season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It was okay. I, I did like the trope that it had, and I'm, I'm gonna call this here, so let me just save. Um, I did like the trope that they created of, uh, oh man, this thing is happening here in the Marvel Universe. This thing adjacent to the Avengers happening. Like, there's a point where they're just like, oh, we found a, a 1375, and it's like, what's a 1375? And it's like, it's a mystical item. The last one we found was a hammer, and it's like, whoa! But it was just silly. <laughs> I, um, I didn't, I didn't really think it was that great, but it was, it was fun. That being said, this game is fun too, and uh, I will continue to play it every Sunday until I finish it, and then I'll move on to Phantom 2, and then who knows where after that, but we'll see. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for watching the future if you watch on the past broadcast tab on the browser version, or if you watch on the YouTube archive. Um, my uh, personal YouTube is also on there, which I'm working on a quarantine movie review catch-up that is about an hour unedited. It's gonna be a little shorter otherwise, but yeah, it's gonna be a, kind of a large video, but check that out. Links are down below under the uh, the browser version of the stream and the schedule for what I do, which I update uh, as often as I can. Time subject to change, I'll change them in there. Whatever. Watch out for uh, tweets on my Twitter, at IggyDKid, which you can see right under there, and my YouTube, and my website, all that. Check it all out. I'd appreciate it a great deal. 
follow if you have not followed, because it is free and I need to get 50 to uh, be an affiliate, which I would appreciate a great deal. I worked pretty hard on this. So, thank you again for watching. Have a good night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, my shortcuts make this... Would have made this less awkward. Uh, where's my mouse? There it is. Goodbye.